So in the previous lecture we have started looking at uh, the algebraic and the geometric multiplicity of an operator right and we saw that there are some interesting features such as if you were to transform this operator or look at this operator subject to a new basis at least the geometric and the algebraic multiplicities do not change. In fact we have also seen that the characteristic polynomial also remains invariant under a change of basis right. So today we are going to probe a little deeper into this idea of geometric multiplicity and subsequently we are going to come up with a condition for diagonalizability of a linear operator right. So we have seen that of pivotal importance in our studies has been this particular subspace right where A is of course the operator or you can treat it as a matrix as I said we will not distinguish them too often here right. So this is the subspace that we have actually given a name we have called it Wi and it is precisely the dimension of Wi perhaps I denoted it by the variable Li if not mistaken is that what it was right. So this is what we call the geometric multiplicity of lambda i which is an eigenvalue of A right. So today we are going to see an interesting property of this Wi right. So consider lambda 1, lambda 2 till lambda k to be distinct eigenvalues of A right. Then look at W which we now define as W1 plus W2 plus so on till WK. We understand what this means. It is a sum of subspaces. We are familiar with this object, right? Of course, our V is finite dimensional. Again, whenever we are studying eigenvalues and eigenvectors, V is finite dimensional. We have said already that if you have infinite dimensional vector spaces the existence of eigenvalues cannot be guaranteed. Hmm? So we will do well to keep that in mind. The point that is going to be made here is very interesting which is suppose B i is a basis for W i right. So W i's are of course these objects right. Hmm? Then the union of these basis sets is a basis for W right. So that is our claim that if you look at these subspaces so defined yeah corresponding to distinct eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda k no two of which are equal right and you look at those subspaces and because these are finite dimensional you will always have basis for these subspaces. So you take the basis of W1 take the basis vectors of W2 and take the union of this set of basis vectors for each of those subspaces that will give you a basis for W right. Additionally the above is a direct sum. At this point I have not claimed that this is a direct sum it is just a sum of subspaces but I am now claiming that this is also going to be a direct sum all right. 
what is it that you immediately understand when we say something is a direct sum? The intersections of any two of those, yeah, is going to be trivial, except from, for the zero vector, nothing else can be in common between these objects. So that's the whole claim. Okay. So if you want to prove this, it will of course constitute in showing two things. That is the first part, the part prior to this direct sum will involve showing two things. What are those two things? The fact that this set, this is a set, right? This is a set. It's a union of multiple sets, so it's a set. The fact that this set that I box now is a linearly independent set and that this is a generating set for W. If I show that, then I'll be done with the first part, right? So first I'll show that this is indeed a generating set for any vector in W. That should be pretty obvious actually. The part that about this being a generating set is not very hard to see. So consider W belonging to W, all right? So if W belongs to this subspace W, which is nothing but the sum of these subspaces, I can write little w as w1 plus w2 plus till wk where wi belongs to the subspace wi, i going from 1 through k. After all, that is what it means for something to belong to the sum of subspaces. Now, where is this object coming from then? W1, this object from W2. What do we know to be a basis for W1? The subspace W1, I mean. It's objects in B1, right? So, let elements in Bi be given by, so remember again, because it's finite dimensional, it will have a termination point. You cannot have infinite number of objects in this basis sets, right? So let elements in bi be given by bi is equal to wi1, wi2 until wi, uh, let's say, what should I, what variable should I use? mi. which means that the dimension of wi is little mi, yeah, right? No questions about this? All right, which means that w can be written as summation alpha i j w i j, of course, there will be a double summation, or oh, maybe I will just open up the bracket and help you see this easily, okay? So let's just say summation W1 J alpha 1 J J going from 1 through M1 plus summation alpha 2 J W2 J J going from 1 through M2 until alpha, what is the number, k, j, w, k, j, j going from 1 through m, k, clear? These are objects in the basis B1, these are objects, linear combination of objects in the basis B2, likewise these are linear combination of objects in the basis B, k. So, this then obviously belongs to the span of W11, W12 until W1M1, comma, W21, W22 until W2M2, likewise until 
w k 1 w k 2 until w k m k right. I could have used a double summation I just felt that this helps in better visualization which is nothing but in the span of what? The union of B i's is not it? Yeah, this is the union of B i's. I have just stitched together all the elements in individual basis sets and I have gotten this huge yeah, m k times k, this large set right. So, this definitely is a generating set implies union b k sorry union b i I should write is a spanning set for w. So, the spanning part of this candidate has been verified. Now, we need to ensure that this set this large set that we have here is also linearly independent right. So, I am going to erase this part. So, consider I am going to just use the same notation all right it is going to be very handy and you will see in a moment why. Sir, Summation yes. In general for showing it is a generating set do not we need to show it both ways usually? No we need to show that this set of vectors just any vector that you have from a subspace belongs to, that. belongs to the span. And if I have something here it belongs to W like. Yeah so that means this set actually does not contain anything more than W. No, no, no. So, you might have some redundancies. So, for example, a basis for a original vector space is also a generating set for a subspace, a proper subspace of the vector space. You might just assign a weight 0 to those vectors in the basis which do not belong to that subspace. So, you might have redundancies, but of course, in that case, it does not make sense because the objects themselves must also come from that subspace. So, in general, of course, uh, we do not encounter such situations. So, that is only trivially obvious. The fact is that this is what we were required to show that this is generating generating set and we have done that. So, next part is to show that it is also linearly independent. If it is linearly independent I put forth to you that this sum that I have written here yeah. So, that is why I did not I actually thought better of this than to write use the double sub summation here because I am going to use this. So, if I you now posit that this has to be linearly independent. I have to first check that when this sum becomes equal to 0, it is only possible if each of these alpha 1 j, alpha 1 1, alpha 1 2 till alpha 1 m 1, alpha 2 1, alpha 2 2 till alpha 2 m 2 and so on till alpha k 1, alpha k 2, so on till alpha k m k, all of them have to vanish. If that is so, only then I will be able to conclude that it is linearly independent. So, consider the same sum here, okay, except that uh, the posing of this is a little different now. So, I am going to still use the ok let me use betas. So, as not to confuse you. So, let us say this is beta 1 j w 1 j plus summation j running from 1 through m 2 beta 2 j w 2 j plus so on till summation j running from 1 through m k beta k j w k j is equal to 0. Now, there is something very interesting that will happen. Forget about this part, just focus on this. We are claiming that this sum is 0, when is it possible? Now, if I just focus on this object, where does this come from? w 1. If I focus on this object this comes from w 2. If I focus on this object this comes from w k similarly. So, this means that no matter what this combination is after all at the end of the day this is just some w 1 plus w 2 till w k that is vanishing 
right. So, this is my w1, this is my w2 and this is my wk. So, if this has to vanish then I must have a bunch of vectors each coming from those different kernels or different wi's whose sum must vanish. But what are these wi's after all? They are in the kernel of a minus lambda i i. What sort of vectors live inside the kernel of a minus lambda i i? The Eigen vectors, is not it? So, w1 is an Eigen vector corresponding to lambda 1, w2 is an Eigen vector corresponding to lambda 2, dot 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 until wk is an Eigen vector corresponding to lambda k, and these are distinct Eigen values. What do we know about Eigen vectors corresponding to distinct Eigen values? Linearly independent, and this is definitely a legit linear combination of linearly independent fellows. So, they cannot be 0. Do you see they cannot be 0 unless all are zeros themselves. So, they are not even Eigen vectors. If they are Eigen vectors, then this is not possible. So, this is not possible unless w i is equal to 0 for i is equal to 1, 2 until k. Please ask if this is not clear. This is the crux of the proof essentially. Please ask if this is not clear. Do not hesitate. I will just repeat just in case you are missing the point here. The point is that this sum is just a basic test for linear independence, right. If it is linearly independent then each of these objects must vanish. So, I just put a linear combination of these fellows and equate it to 0 and check whether it is possible for any non-trivial linear combination. Straightforward, very basics. Next, I observe that this sum, the first term of this comes from w1. So, let us label it as w1. The second term comes from the subspace w2. Let us call it little w2. So, on the kth term comes from the subspace wk. Let us label it little wk. And then I equate the sum to 0. The next observation is the crucial bit where I observe that after all objects inside the subspace w i are nothing but Eigen vectors corresponding to lambda i and the lambda i's by my very premise are all distinct and earlier much earlier in this course maybe some 4 or 5 lectures back we have proved that Eigen vectors corresponding to distinct Eigen values must be linearly independent and therefore any linear combination you take of those Eigen vectors that must be non-zero right any non-trivial linear combination. So, this is one such non-trivial linear combination because each of the coefficients is 1. So, where, what, are, what are we possibly missing? The only possibility is that these fellows cannot be legitimate Eigen vectors. How can we ensure that they are not legitimate Eigen vectors? Well, there is this one deal which says that the Eigen vectors must be non-zero. Anything is inside, any zero vector is inside the kernel of any operator. So, only when the vector is non-zero, non-trivial then it makes sense to define it as an Eigen vector otherwise 0 will be the Eigen vector for everything. No sense, right? So, therefore, the only way that these fellows fail to be Eigen vectors are if each of them individually is 0. If any one of them fails to be 0, then we cannot have this situation because then it is an Eigen vector and linear combination of Eigen vectors corresponding to distinct Eigen values can never vanish unless the linear combination is trivial which it clearly is not. Is that clear? Now, if each individual w i is 0, that means each of these individual sums becomes 0, which means that summation beta i j j going from 1 through m i w i j is equal to 0. But these are after all what? These are elements in the basis b i and a basis by definition is linearly independent. So, therefore, I arrive at the conclusion that, so this is true for all i, yeah. So, beta i j is equal to 0 for all i belonging to the set 1, 2 until k 
and for all j belonging to the set 1, 2, 3 until m i. But that is essentially the definition of linear independence of these fellows, which means that the union of the basis sets is also a linearly independent set, right. So let me erase this part now. That means right it is a linearly independent set it is a generating set of course therefore by putting together those two things now for the final bit which is when we have to show that it is a direct sum right. So consider W belonging to intersection of Wi and Wj for i not equal to j, which means that A minus lambda i i acting on W is equal to 0, A minus lambda j i acting on W is equal to 0. You take the difference and you are led to concluding that lambda j minus lambda i times w is equal to 0, but lambda j minus lambda i is clearly not equal to 0 because they are distinct eigenvalues, yeah. So therefore, w is equal to 0. So any time you have something in the intersection of any two of those subspaces, it must be only the 0 vector and nothing more than that. And therefore, indeed that was a direct sum, right. And you can also check by the dimensions now. Individual dimensions if they are m i, then the overall dimension is summation m i. That also tallies with our understanding of dimensions and how they work out over direct sums, right. So this is an important result which is going to pave the way for now our big result which is going to talk about diagonalizability of an operator. So this part is clear, if it is then I will probably erase that part and write our next result. So for A which is an operator from V to itself, of course finite dimensional vector space, let us just put it right there even if it is obvious, okay. The following are equivalent 1 a is diagonalizable to <coughs> algebraic multiplicity of lambda i is equal to dimension w i for all i, okay. Lambda i obviously denotes the ith eigenvalue of A. So of course all that is implied here, all right. And third, A has n, so of course finite dimensional, let us just say the dimension is n that will make life easier. A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. So we are not talking about distinct eigenvalues or anything. As it turns out we do not need distinct eigenvalues. One clear cut example as I mentioned earlier is the identity matrix all its eigenvalues are 1, they are all repeated, the extreme case and yet it is a diagonal matrix. So obviously you do not require all n eigenvalues to be distinct, it is a sufficient condition for diagonalizability as we have seen. Now this is exactly or precisely the condition, okay. 
if you want diagonalizability then this is by the way what the geometric multiplicity of lambda i you may also write it as such right so i might have of course defined the characteristic polynomial and shown you all that product form and all but instead because i have already taken the trouble of defining the algebraic multiplicity i'm just going to use that notation here yeah this of course is the definition of the geometric multiplicity this part right okay what does it mean when we say that an operator is diagonalizable see the main crux of this will again be down to understanding what these statements actually mean once you see what they mean things will become very obvious so let's first try and understand or parse these statements when we say that a is diagonalizable what we are essentially saying is that there is a basis in v corresponding to which the representation of the operator a turns out to be a diagonal matrix that is the meaning of diagonalizable remember right at the beginning of this course when we were talking about the preliminary goals of this course one was to solve ax is equal to b and the second was this p inverse ap getting it down to a diagonal form what is the p inverse ap now having done so many uh, so much of this course having covered so much of this we have a better understanding that p inverse ap is just the representation of a subject to some change of basis some basis so if we can say that p inverse ap is equal to some diagonal matrix it means a is diagonalizable or in the language of basis we understand that there exists some basis subject to the choice of which the operator looks completely like a decoupled and we've seen the benefits of this in particularly in solving differential equations right you have nth order or nth degree differential equation it reduces to just solving n first order differential equations that's very simple is it not right so let us try and prove this what do you mean by unique basis i mean you take any vector you scale it up and down it's still an eigen vector you take any vector in the span of that particular vector right that is also an eigen vector is it not if 1 0 is an eigen vector of a particular 2 by 2 matrix then so is 1000 0 1 0 1000 0 1 billion 0 or 10 to the power minus 30 0 all of them are eigen vectors so i might choose a basis you might choose another basis you might scale up those matrices in different order in different manner there's no claim for uniqueness of eigen vectors eigen values sure unless you put more restriction that the eigen vector has to be of unit norm or something of such sort you will never be able to get it down to some unique object even so you might have multiple eigen vectors for the same eigen value for example for the identity yeah you take any of the standard basis elements they are its eigen vectors but the funny thing is you take any vector in the euclidean space it's an eigen vector so if you are already starting with the ident identity matrix you take any basis so such a basis is obviously not going to be unique right So there's no claim for uniqueness we will get into this question maybe after covering quite a bit we will get into this when something is diagonalizable and when things are not diagonalizable and so on and so forth and when they are not diagonalizable we'll see that the best we can do is jordan form and then we'll see why it makes sense to study the jordan form because you might think it's a corner case which it is because unless you have repeated eigen values you'll never run into trouble See, if you have distinct eigen values it's always diagonalizable you might think oh if you have repeated eigen values only then this seems to because and this also suggests as much so in general if you have distinct eigen values always diagonalizable so why shouldn't we stop our studies there and go further but sometimes the eigen values are not just about your numerical computation you see sometimes it's the nature of a physical system that di that dictates that your eigen values will have to be repeated suppose the physical model of a system necessitates that the system will have repeated eigen values it's not about your calculation or computation where you can just say oh just give it a little bit of tweaking and perturbation here and there and you immediately have distinct eigen values right so it still makes sense 
So we will now try and establish this. Any other questions on this? Okay, maybe we will postpone this proof to the next module.